Section One of the Broken Shaft Tales in Mid Ocean. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by TJP fourteen twenty one. The Broken Shaft Tales in Mid Ocean. Edited by Henry Norman. On board the Bavaria. The good ship Bavaria lay at anchor in Queenstown Harbor, waiting for the mails, and only the little cloud of white steam curling from her escape pipe gave sign of the huge forces hidden beneath her placid exterior. Her decks were almost deserted, for her passengers had yielded as usual to that ridiculous fascination of a few more hours on land, which forms apparently the staple industry of the city of Queenstown and is probably responsible for more seasickness than all other causes put together. But the eminent tragedian was far too wary to leave the ship at the one moment of the whole fortnight when her decks were reasonably still, and as he leaned over the rail of the upper deck and watched the little waves lapping musically round the black sides of the great liner, he was almost the only figure visible. He took off his eyeglasses, wiped them, and replaced them with admirable accuracy. He removed his peak cap for a moment and ran his long, graceful fingers through his hair. He drew a dainty cigarette case from his pocket, lighted a cigarette, and, thrusting his hands deep into the pockets of his thick pea jacket, he wedged himself comfortably between the lifeboat and the rail and gave himself up to general reflections, which doubtless proved as pleasing to him as they must be to any man who neither remembers nor contemplates anything but success. So comfortable did he find himself in his new corner, and so entertaining or profitable did his meditations prove, that he was not a little displeased to notice some footsteps passing beneath him on the lower deck, and turning toward the companion ladder. A moment later, a pleasant baritone voice broke out carelessly with lover's old song, suggested naturally by the last glimpse of Aaron. What will you do, love, when I am going, with white sails flowing the seas beyond? And the eminent tragedian had hardly time to discover whether he was more pleased by the voice or amused by the words, before the head of the singer appeared above the deck. It was that of a young man of perhaps thirty, with rather long, fair hair and a slight drooping mustache. He mounted the ladder with quick steps, still happily singing, and had just got to the second verse. What would you do, love, when home returning, with high hopes burning, for wealth for you? When his eyes fell on the eminent tragedian, wedged in the corner. He stopped short, and seemed for a moment on the point of sliding down the ladder out of sight, for they had met often before, but always as critic and criticized, with the deceitful glare of the footlights between them. His embarrassment, however, passed away as quickly as it had come and stepping upon the deck with the ease of a well-traveled man, he lifted his hat to the eminent tragedian, whom, although he had never met before, he felt instantly that it would be both absurd and unmannerly for him to pretend not to know, and express formally but deferentially his pleasure at this unlooked-for meeting. The eminent tragedian, who had felt a greater embarrassment, though he had showed none, was still more courteous, as became his more distinguished position in reciprocating these expressions, and added, with more than enough politeness to cover the sarcasm, I venture to anticipate, sir, much profit from this meeting. There was an awkward pause, and both men looked up at the rigging. The younger man lowered his eyes after a moment, to find the other one's gaze fixed upon him with an amused expression, and the first signs of a smile hovering about his lips. Their eyes met, and as if by some pre-established harmony of humour, they burst simultaneously into a hearty laugh. "'My dear fellow,' exclaimed the tragedian, extending his hand cordially, "'I am really delighted to make your acquaintance. I dare say I shall learn something from meeting you. And who knows, but you may unlearn something from knowing me. Won't you finish that song?' Under the circumstances, hardly any request could have been refused but the conversation was interrupted by a shriek from the whistle of the tugboat, bringing the returning passengers and the mails from Queenstown, which had drawn almost alongside unnoticed. 
the two men leaned upon the rail side by side and scrutinized their approaching fellow travelers for some minutes of silence we shall be a small party remarked the eminent tragedian at length i have two old friends among them but the rest are strangers to me who for instance is that big athletic-looking fellow with the deep-set eyes and short brown beard frenchman evidently no more frenchman replied the critic than an american or an italian or for the matter of that a hindu he's the novelist you know who began the story of allahabad and went from there to rome and then to boston and now i believe he's just done with persia an extraordinary fellow so i've been told began by trudging on foot through the dangerous districts of italy disguised as a peasant with a knife in his boot picking up the dialects as he passed along then he edited a newspaper in india and learned hindustani and magic a man with half a dozen mother tongues who just about to settle down in life as a professor of classical philology when he discovered that fiction was his strong point i don't know of myself but we have a common friend on board that dark fellow in the long yellow ulster on the paddle box rolling a cigarette and he has told me all about him they were both special correspondents bound for the same part of the world and they met at niagara they went together to see the falls by moonlight and climbed out on a big boulder overhanging the edge of the horseshoe fall fascinated by the moonlight and the marvellous lunar bow they sat there for an hour or two in the roar of the cataract till at last my friend dropped off to sleep and was quietly slipping over the edge of the rock when the novelist yonder happened to look round just in time to catch him by the collar dear me said the tragedian how interesting we must make him tell us some of his stories ah there's my old friend the editor that tall fair man with the pointed beard you know him by name well replied the other not otherwise then i envy you the pleasure in store a fine fellow yes fine is exactly the word that describes him a man with a mind and bright as supple as his own rapier and the tragedian made a gesture with a quick turn of the wrist that recalled hamlet's palpable hit now there's an interesting figure that tall bent man with the long dark hair and pale face coming out of the cabin wrapped up as if he were in the arctic circle i wonder who he is i know him replied the critic instantly he is a living mystery of literature an invalid himself he produces book after book filled with the very spirit of health books which give you the physical tonic of a gallop across the fields in the morning and thrill you like a plunge in the deep sea the first prose writer of our time i don't quite mean that of course but certainly the first romancer nobody else can throw such a halo of interesting personality round a poor little she-donkey or make a child's toy boat with its penny cannon in the bow so significant and pathetic an emblem of the most touching aspect of human life or take the absurdly impossible and transmute it by his imagination into something so real that as soon as any of us has read it it passes into an episode of his own life and so they chatted pleasantly the eminent tragedian and his critic discussing their fellow passengers while the great brown sacks of letters were carried on board one by one on the backs of hurrying sailors some of the travelers were friends and some were strangers some were famous and some were unknown Last of all came an elastic figure, over the swinging gangway and along the deck, with a buoyant step and a breezy laugh. The wind snatched the yellow locks from under her navy blue cap, and the trim pilot jacket with brass buttons gave a bewildering nautical air to the form which is associated in everyone's mind with Portia and Ophelia and, sweetest of all, with Beatrice. Nothing she wore comes within the limits of intelligible description. Her drapery was a law unto itself. So fearfully and wonderfully was it made. But woe to the woman, who should imagine that she could wear similar raiment with the same irresistible grace. Nor did this wonderful figure advance like an ordinary mortal. Whether it was a walk, or a slide, or an undulation, or a kind of swimming, nobody could determine. Certainly not the taciturn old captain, who gazed and gazed and at last fervently murmured, bless my soul as he turned to give the order which swung the head of the bavaria round toward the red west and sent her ploughing through the great waters to the new world 
Four days later, it was again evening, and the deep glow of an ocean sunset was pouring in obliquely through the open portholes of the saloon of the Bavaria. It was reflected backward and forward in broad beams from the great mirrors, and it sparkled in points of gold on the glass and silver hanging over the heads of the passengers as they sat at dinner. At the head of the table, on the port side of the vessel, sat the captain. At his right hand, Beatrice, and at his left, the eminent tragedian. Near them were the editor, the novelist, the romancer, the critic, and half a dozen other congenial spirits whom Providence, in the shape of the purser, had brought together for company. They knew one another well by this time, and all the old sea jokes went round, and many a new and merry story and good thrust. But as all roads lead to Rome, so all conversations on shipboard have one conclusion. Whatever beginning a conversation may have, personal, meteorological, anecdotal, gastronomic, it always ends in an interchange of ideas on the probable date of arrival in port. And this momentous subject was regularly reached by the party on the Bavaria each day with a dessert. For myself, the novelist was saying, I should welcome delay. These are full days for me. And he made a note on his cuff. Tis time elaborately thrown away, said the critic. I have often noticed, remarked the romancer, that the farther one is from land, the nearer one is to one's fellows. Far be the land from us. Procul profini. Don't, exclaimed Beatrice. It sounds like a spell. I'm horribly superstitious, and when Fido barks in his sleep, I always know something unpleasant is going to happen. You fou et voir ces mairies pied, quoted the editor. I have a great comfort from this fellow, said the eminent tragedian, lifting his glass politely to the captain, with the calm assurance that there was no danger of the weather-beaten seaman being able to finish the quotation. Methinks he has no drowning mark upon him. Oh, don't, don't. I'll leave the table, cried Beatrice. Four days from now, interposed the captain with authority, we shall be off the hook. The next morning you will be seeing one of the prettiest sights of your life, an early morning sail up New York Harbor. I know nothing like it, except the grimy wharf at Liverpool, when the wife and bairns are watching for me. Four days from tomorrow morning, that is. He added, for like all sailors, he could not resist his gruesome joke. Unless Davy Jones himself. Nobody ever knew exactly how it happened. The captain was halfway up the companionway, and the tragedian was picking up a champagne bottle out of Beatrice's lap before they realized that anything had occurred. Afterward, they understood it at all. How the captain's words had been cut short by a tremendous jar which upset everything on the table and sent the plates and wine glasses spinning about in all directions and brought down the cruets with a crash from the hooks overhead. How the captain had dropped his knife and fork and was almost on deck before they knew he had gone, and how there had come a great deafening blow, shaking the whole ship from stem to stern, then a moment's utter silence, worse even than the noise, and then another sickening blow as if some giant of the deep had picked up the vessel and flung her down at his feet. Then all was still, except the lap, lap, lap of the waves as they flew by. Most of the passengers rushed helter-skelter to the doors, but the party at the captain's table did not wholly lose their wits. The editor, the romancer, and the critic sprang to their feet and looked at one another without a word. The tragedian turned instantly to support Beatrice, who, with a little subdued shriek, was about to faint when her eyes fell upon the novelist opposite. He was seated impassively, with the long neck of a bottle of sherry sticking out of one of his capacious pockets busily engaged in filling the other with whatever eatables he could lay his hands upon. So she only burst into a peal of that merry, childlike laughter which so many love to hear. And, after a minute, they all joined the crowd hurrying up the stairs. They reached the deck at the same moment as the captain, who was returning quietly from the bridge. "'Ladies and gentlemen,' he said, "'don't be alarmed. There is not the slightest danger. We have only broken our shaft.' So the captain's prophecy did not come true. Four days from the eventful evening when the breaking of the shaft interrupted the company at dinner, Sandy Hook was as far off as ever, and the Bavaria was lying to 
with just enough sail spread to keep her head to the wind. What there was of it, which had blown persistently from the wrong quarter. For four days she had been drifting about, a great iron coal freighted hulk, now a few miles one way, now the other, but except the delay, her passengers had suffered no inconvenience. The novelty of being helplessly becalmed, however, had worn off after a few hours, and a dull, leaden ennui had settled down upon them. Without wind, and plenty of it, there is no good spirits on board ship. Without movement in the vessel, there is none in the veins of the passengers. As the evening was closing on the fourth day, the same group was gathered together on the lee side of the deck houses, silent, ill-tempered, bored to death. In the center, Beatrice was reclining in a steamer chair, enveloped in rugs from neck to feet, and her face hidden by a thick veil. On one side of her stood the eminent tragedian, on the other the editor, and round them were stretched upon the deck in a variety of unconventionally comfortable attitudes the romancer, the critic, and the novelist. The last named was deeply engrossed in the congenial task of translating Der König in Thio into classical Greek. He had rendered most of it to his satisfaction, and was beginning the last verse when he was suddenly interrupted by the voice of the tragedian addressing him. How absurd not to have thought of it before! My dear sir, when I saw you coming aboard and heard of your wonderful experiences, I promised myself that on the very first opportunity I would summon you, in the name of our party, to put some of them in narrative form for us. That opportunity is here. Night, moonlight, this mysterious and inspiring expanse of silvery water. All nature is propitious, and your listeners are eager. Your memory and your portfolio must be full of thrilling stories. Come, an honest tale speeds best. Before the novelist had time to say a word, the tragedian's request was backed by the others with such instant unanimity that when the chorus of entreaty had ceased, excuse was no longer possible. He hesitated for a few moments only, then drawing himself up till his back rested comfortably against the deck house, and arranging himself carefully in his rug, he lighted a cigarette, and he told the following tale. End of section one. Recording by TJP, 1421. Section two of The Broken Shaft Tales in Mid-Ocean This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Patrick79 The Broken Shaft Tales in Mid-Ocean Edited by Henry Norman The Upper Berth by F. Marion Crawford Somebody asked for the cigars. We had talked long, and the conversation was beginning to languish. The tobacco smoke had got into the heavy curtains, the wine had got into those brains which were liable to become heavy, and it was already perfectly evident that, unless somebody did something to rouse our oppressed spirits, the meeting would soon come to its natural conclusion and we the guests would speedily go home to bed and most certainly to sleep no one had said anything very remarkable it may be that no one had anything very much remarkable to say jones had given us every particular of his last minute hunting in yorkshire mr tomkins of boston had explained at elaborate length those working principles by the due and careful maintenance of which the atkinson topeka and santa fe railroad not only extended its territory increased its departmental influence and transported livestock without starving them to death before the day of actual delivery but also had for years succeeded in deceiving those passengers who bought its tickets into the fallacious belief that the corporation aforesaid was really able to transport human life without destroying it. Signor Tombola had endeavoured to persuade us, by arguments which we took no trouble to oppose, that the unity of his country was in no way resembled the average modern torpedo, 
carefully planned, constructed with all the skills of the greatest European arsenals, but, when constructed, destined to be directed by feeble hands into a region where it must, it must undoubtedly explode, unseen, unfeared, and unheard, into the illimitable wastes of political chaos. It is unnecessary to go into further details. The conversation had assumed proportions which would have bored Prometheus on his rock, which would have driven Tantalus to distraction, and which would have impelled Ixion to seek relaxation in the simple but instructive dialogues of Herr Ollendorf, rather than submit to the greater evil of listening to our talk. We had sat at our table for hours. We were bored, we were tired, and nobody showed any signs of moving. Somebody called for the cigars. We all instinctively looked towards the speaker. Brisbane was a man of five and thirty years of age, and remarkable for those gifts which chiefly attract the attention of men. He was a strong man. The external proportions of his figure presented nothing extraordinary to the common eye, though his size was above average. He was a little over six feet in height, and moderately broad in the shoulder. He did not appear to be stout, but, on the other hand, he was certainly not thin. His small head was supported by a strong and sinewy neck. His broad muscular hands appeared to possess a peculiar skill in, in breaking walnuts without the assistance of the ordinary cracker, and seeing him in profile, one could not help remarking the extraordinary breadth of his sleeves, the unusual thickness of his chest. He was one of those men who are commonly spoken of as among men as being deceptive, that is to say, that though he looked exceedingly strong, he was, in reality, very much stronger than he looked. Of his features I need say little. His head is small, his hair is thin, his eyes are blue, his nose is large. He has a small moustache and a square jaw. Everybody knows Brisbane, and when he asked for a cigar, everybody looked at him. "'It is a very singular thing,' said Brisbane. Everybody stopped talking. Brisbane's voice was not loud, but possessed a peculiar quality of penetrating general conversation and cutting it like a knife. Everybody listened. Brisbane, perceiving that he had attracted their general attention, lit his cigar with great equanimity. "'It is very singular,' he continued, "'that thing about ghosts. "'People are always asking whether anybody has seen a ghost. "'Well, I have.' "'Oh, bosh! What, you? "'You don't mean to say so, Brisbane. "'Well, for a man of intelligence!' "'A chorus of exclamations greeted Brisbane's remarkable statement. "'Everybody called for cigars.' and Stubbs the butler suddenly appeared from the depths of nowhere with a fresh bottle of dry champagne, and the situation was saved. Brisbane was going to tell a story. I am an old sailor, and as I have to cross the Atlantic pretty often, I have my favourites. Most men have their favourites. I have seen a man wait in a Broadway bar for three-quarters of an hour for a particular car which he liked. I believe the barkeeper made at least one-third of his living by that man's preference. I have a habit of waiting for certain ships when I am obliged to cross that duck-pond. It may be a bit prejudiced, but I was never cheated out of a good passage but once in my life, and I remember it very well. It was a warm morning in June, and the custom-house officials who were hanging about waiting for a steamer, already on her way up from quarantine, presented a peculiarly hazy and thoughtful appearance. 
I had not much luggage. I never have. I mingled in the crowd of passengers, porters, and officious individuals in blue coats and brass buttons, who seemed to spring up like mushrooms from the deck of a moored steamer to obtrude their unnecessary services upon the independent passenger. I have often noticed, with a certain interest, the spontaneous evolution of these fellows. They are not there when you arrive. Five minutes after the pilot has called, Go ahead! They, or at least their blue coats and brass buttons, have disappeared from deck and gangway as completely as though they had been consigned to that locker which tradition unanimously ascribes as Davy Jones. But at the moment of starting, they are there clean-shaved, blue-coated, and ravenous for fees. I hastened aboard. The Kamchatka was one of my favourite ships. I say was, because she emphatically no longer is. I cannot conceive of any inducement which could entice me to take another voyage in her. Yes, I know what you're going to say. She is uncommonly clean in the run-aft. She has enough bluffing off in the bows to keep her dry, and the lower berths are most of them double. She has a lot of advantages, but I won't cross in her again. Excuse the digression. I got on board. I hailed a steward, whose red nose and redder whiskers were equally familiar to me. One hundred and five lower berth, said I, in a business-like tone peculiar to men who think no more of crossing the Atlantic than well, taking a whisky cocktail at downtown Delmonico's. The steward took my portmanteau, greatcoat and rug. I shall never forget the expression of his face. Not that he turned pale. It is maintained by most eminent divines that even miracles cannot change the course of nature. I have no hesitation in saying that he did not turn pale. But, from his expression, I judged that he was either about to shed tears, or sneeze, or, or to drop my portmanteau, as the latter contained two bottles of particularly fine old sherry presented to me for my voyage by the old friend Snickins and Van Pickens, I felt extremely nervous. But the steward did none of these things. "'Well, I'll be damned,' said he in a low voice, and led the way. I suppose my Hermes, as he led me to the lower regions, had had a little grog, but I said nothing and followed him. 105 was on the port side, well aft. There was nothing remarkable about the stateroom. The lower berth, like most of those upon the Kamchatka, was double. There was plenty of room. There was the usual washing apparatus calculated to convey an idea of luxury, to the mind of the North American Indian. There were the usual inefficient racks of brown wood, in which it is more easy to hang a large-sized umbrella than a common toothbrush of commerce. Upon the uninvited mattress were carefully folded together blankets which great modern humorists have aptly compared to cold buckwheat cakes. The question of towels was left entirely to the imagination. The glass decanters were filled with a, a transparent liquid faintly tinged with brown, but from which an odour, less faint, but not more pleasing, ascended to the nostrils, like the far-off seasick remnants of, reminiscence of oily machinery. Sad coloured curtains half closed the upper berth. The hazy June daylight shed a faint illumination upon the desolate little scene. Ah, oh, how I hate that stateroom! The steward deposited my traps and looked at me, as though he wanted to get away, probably in search of more passengers and more fees. It is always a good plan to start in favour with these functionaries, and I, accordingly, gave him certain coins there and then. "'I'll try and make you comfortable all I can,' he remarked, as he put the coins in his pocket. Nevertheless, there was a doubtful intonation in his voice which surprised me. Possibly his scale of fees had gone up, and, uh, and he was not satisfied. 
but on the whole I was inclined to think that, as he himself would have expressed it, he was the better for a glass. I was wrong, however, and did the man injustice. Nothing especially worthy of mention occurred during that day. We left the pier punctually, and it was very pleasant to be fairly well under way, for the weather was warm and sultry, and, and the motion of the steamer produced a refreshing breeze. Everybody knows what the first day at sea is like. People pace the decks and stare at each other, and occasionally meet acquaintances whom they did not know to be on board. There is the usual uncertainty as to whether the food will be good, bad, or indifferent, until the first two meals have put the matter beyond doubt. There is the usual uncertainty about the weather, until the ship is fairly off Fire Island. The tables are crowded at first, and then suddenly thinned. Pale-faced people spring from their seats and precipitate themselves towards the door, and each old sailor breathes more freely as his seasick neighbour rushes from his side, leaving him plenty of elbow-room and unlimited command of the mustard. One passage across the Atlantic is very much like another, and he who cross very often do not make the voyage for the sake of novelty. Whales and icebergs are indeed always objects of interest, but, after all, one whale is very much like another whale, and one rarely sees an iceberg at close quarters. To the majority of us, the most delightful moment of the day on board an ocean steamer is when we have taken our last turn on deck, have smoked our last cigar, and having succeeded in tiring ourselves, feel at liberty to turn in with a clear conscience. On that first night of the voyage, I felt particularly lazy and went to bed in 105 rather early than I usually do. As I turned in, I was amazed to see that I was, I was to have a companion. A portmanteau, very much like my own, lay in the opposite corner, and in the, in the upper berth had been deposited a neatly folded rug with a stick and an umbrella. I had hoped to be alone, but I was dis disappointed. But I wondered who my roommate was to be, and, and, and I was determined to have a look at him. Before I had been long in bed, he entered. He was, as far as I could see, a very tall man, very thin, very pale, with sandy hair and whiskers, and colourless grey eyes. He had about him, I thought, an air of rather dubious fashion, uh, the, the sort of man you might see in Wall Street without being able pre precisely to say what he was doing there, the sort of man who, who frequents the Café Anglais, who always seems to be alone, and who drinks champagne. You might meet him on a race course, but he would never appear to be doing anything there either. A little overdressed, a little odd. There are three or four of his kind on every steamer. I made up my mind that I did not care to make his acquaintance, and I went to sleep saying to myself that I would study his habits in order to avoid him. If he rose early, I would rise late. If he went to bed late, I would go to bed early. I did not care to know him. If you once know people of that kind, they are always turning up. <laughs> Poor fellow! I need not have taken the trouble to come to so many decisions about him, for I never saw him again after that first night in 105. I was sleeping soundly when I was suddenly awaked by a loud noise. To judge from the sound, my roommate must have sprung with a single leap from the upper berth to the floor. I heard him fumbling with the latch on the door, uh, the bolt on the door, which opened almost immediately, and then I heard his footsteps as he ran at full speed down the passage, leaving the door open behind him. The ship was rolling a little, and I expected to hear him stumble or fall, but he ran as though he was running for his life. The door swung on its hinges with the motion of the vessel, and the sound annoyed me. I got up and shut it and groped my way back to my berth in darkness. I went to sleep again, 
and I, I, I have no idea how long I slept. But when I awoke it was still dark, and I felt a disagreeable sensation of cold, and it seemed to me that the air was damp. You know, that particular smell of a, cap a cabin which has been wet with sea-water. I covered myself up as well as I could, and dozed off again, framing complaints to be made the next day, and selecting the most powerful epithets in the language. I could hear my roommate turn over in the upper berth. He had probably returned while I was asleep. Once I thought I heard him groan, and I argued that he was seasick. Oh, that is particularly unpleasant when one is below. Nevertheless, I dozed off and slept till early daylight. The ship was rolling heavily, much more than on the previous evening, and the grey light which came in through the porthole changed in tint with every movement according to the angle of the vessel's side turned the glass seaward or skyward. It was very cold, unaccountably so for the month of June. I turned my head and looked at the porthole, and saw to my surprise that it was wide open and hooked back. I believe I swore audibly. Then I got up and I shut it. As I turned back, I glanced at the upper berth. The curtains were drawn close together. My companion had probably felt cold as I had. It struck me that I had slept enough. The state room was uncomfortable. Though, strange to say, I could not smell the dampness which had annoyed me in the night. My roommate was still asleep. Excellent opportunity for avoiding him. So I dressed at once and went on deck. The day was warm and cloudy, with an oily smell on the water. It was seven o'clock as I came out, much later than I had imagined. I came across the doctor, who was taking his first sniff of the morning air. He was a young man from the west of Ireland, a tremendous fellow with black hair and blue eyes, already a clown inclined to be stout. He had a happy-go-lucky, healthy look about him, which uh, was rather attractive. "'Fine morning,' I remarked by way of, of introduction. "'Well,' said he, eyeing me with an air of ready interest, "'it is a fine morning, and it's not a fine morning. "'I don't think that it's much of a morning at all.' <laughs> "'Well, no, it's not so very fine,' said I. "'It's just what I call fuggly weather,' said the doctor. "'It was very cold last night, I thought,' I remarked. "'However, when I looked about, I found that the porthole was wide open.' I had not noticed it when I went to bed, and the state-room was damp too. Damp, said he. Whereabouts are you? Oh, uh, one hundred and five. And to my surprise the doctor start, started visibly and stared at me. What is the matter? I asked blandly. Oh, nothing, he replied. Only... Everybody has complained of that stateroom for the last three trips. Well, I shall complain too, I said. It has certainly not been properly aired. It is a shame. I don't believe it can be helped, answered the doctor. I believe there is something... Well, it's not my business to frighten passengers. <laughs> you need not be afraid of frightening me, I replied. I can stand any amount of damp. If I should get a cold, I will come to you. I offered the doctor a cigar, which he took and examined very critically. It's not so much the damp, he remarked. However, I dare say you will get on very well. Have you a, a roommate? Well, yes, a deuce of a fellow who bolts out at midnight and leaves the door open. Again the doctor glanced curiously at me. Then he looked at the cigar, and looked grave. "'Did he come back?' he asked presently. "'Well, yes. I, I was asleep, but I, I waked up and heard him moving. Then I felt cold and went to sleep again. This morning I, I found the porthole open.' Now, "'Now look here,' said the doctor quietly. "'I don't 
care much for this ship. I don't care a rap for her reputation. I tell you what I will do. I have a good-sized place up here. I will share it with you, though I, I don't know you from Adam. I was very much surprised at the proposition. I could not imagine why he should take such a sudden interest in my welfare. However, his manner as he spoke of the ship was peculiar. <laughs> you are a very good doctor, I said, but really I believe even now the, cap the cabin could be aired or cleaned out or something. Why, why do you not care for the ship? We are not superstitious in our profession, sir, replied the doctor, but the sea makes people so. I don't want to prejudice you, and I don't want to frighten you, but if you take my advice, you will move in here. I would as soon as see you overboard, he said earnestly, as know that you or any other man was to be asleep in 105. Good gracious! Why? I asked. Just because of the last three ships, the people who have slept there actually have gone overboard, he answered gravely. The intelligence was startling, and exceedingly unpleasant, I confess. I looked hard at the doctor to see whether he was making game of me, but he looked perfectly serious. I thanked him warmly for his offer, but told him I intended to be the exception to the rule by which everyone who slept in that particular stateroom went overboard. He did not say much, but looked as grave as ever, and hinted that before we got across that I should probably reconsider his proposal. In the course of time we went to breakfast, at which only a, an inconsiderable number of passengers assembled. I noticed that one or two of the officers who breakfasted with us looked grave. After breakfast I went into my stateroom in order to get a book. The curtains of the upper berth were still closely drawn. Not a word was to be heard. My roommate was probably still asleep. As I came out, I met the steward whose business it was to look after me. He whispered that the captain wanted to see me, and then scuttled away down the passage as if he was anxious to avoid any questions. I went towards the captain's cabin and found him waiting for me. Sir, he said, I want to ask a favour of you. I answered that I would do anything to oblige him. Your roommate has disappeared, he said. He is known to have turned in early last night. Did you notice anything extraordinary in his manner? The question coming as it did, in exact confirmation of the fears the doctor had expressed half an hour earlier, staggered me. You don't mean that he's gone overboard, do you? I asked. I fear he has, answered the captain. This is the most extraordinary thing, I began. Why? he asked. He is the fourth, then, I explained. In answer to another question from the captain, I explained without mentioning the doctor that I had heard the story concerning 105. He seemed very much annoyed at hearing that I knew of it. I told him that what had occurred in the night. They bolt out of bed and run down the passage. Two of them were seen to go overboard by the watch. We, we stopped and we lowered the boats, but alas, they were not found. Nobody, however, saw or heard of the man who was lost last night. If he is really lost, the steward, who is a superstitious fellow, perhaps, and, and suspecting something to go wrong, went to look for him in the morning, and found his berth empty, but his clothes lying about, just as he had left them. The steward was the only man on board who knew him by sight, and he was searching everywhere for him. He has disappeared. Now, sir, I want to beg you not to mention the circumstances to any of the passengers. I don't want the ship to get a bad name, and nothing hands about an ocean low going liner like stories of suicide. You should have your choice of one of the officers' cabins, if you like, including my own, for the rest of the passage. Is that a fair bargain? Well, very, said I. I am much obliged to you. But since I am alone, and have the stateroom to myself, I would rather not move. If the steward would take out that unfortunate man's things, I would as leave stay where I am. I will not say anything about the matter. 
and I think I can promise you that I will not follow my roommate. The captain tried to dissuade me from my intention, but I, I preferred having a stateroom alone to being the chum of an officer on board. I do not know whether I acted foolishly, but if I had taken his advice, I should have had nothing more to tell. There would have remained the disagreeable coincidence of several suicides occurring among men who slept in the same cabin, but that would have been all. Now, that was not the end of the matter, however, by any means. I obstinately made up my mind that I would not be disturbed by such tales, and I even went as far to argue the question with the captain. There was something wrong about the stateroom, I said. It was rather damp. The porthole had been left open last night. My roommate might have been ill when he came on board, and he might have had some delirium after he went to bed. He might even now be hiding somewhere on board, and might be found later. The place ought to be aired, and the fastening of the port locked too. If the captain would give me leave, I would say that what I thought necessary were done immediately. "'Of course you have the right to stay where you are, if you please,' he replied rather petulantly. "'But I wish you would turn out and let me lock the place up, and be done with it.' I did not see it in the same light, and left the captain, after promising to be silent concerning the disappearance of my companion. The latter had had no acquaintances on board, and was not missed in the course of the day. Towards evening I met the doctor again, and he asked me whether I had changed my mind. I told him I had not. Ah, then, you will before long, he said very gravely. We played whist in the evening, and I went to bed late. I will confess now that I felt a disagreeable sensation when I entered my stateroom. I could not help thinking of the tall man I had seen in the previous night, who was now dead, drowned, tossing about in the long swell two or three hundred miles astern. His face rose very distinctly before me as I undressed, and I even went so far as to draw back the curtains of the upper berth, as though to persuade myself that he was actually gone. I also bolted the door of the staterooms. Suddenly I became aware that the portal was open and fastened back. This was more than I could stand. I hastily threw on my dressing gown and went to search of Robert, the steward of my passage. I was very angry. I remember, and when I found him, I dragged him roughly to the door of one of five and pushed him towards the open portal. What the deuce do you mean, you scoundrel, by leaving that port open every night? Do you know it's against regulations? Do you know that if the ship healed and the water become, began to come in, ten men would not be able to shut it? I will report you to the captain, you blackguard, for endangering the ship. I was exceedingly wroth. The man trembled and turned pale, and then began to shut the round glass plate with the heavy brass fittings. Why don't you answer me? I said roughly. If you please, sir, faltered Robert, there is nobody on board as can keep this ere port shut at night. You, you can try it yourself. I ain't a-going to stop any longer on board of this vessel, sir. I ain't indeed. But if I was you, sir, I'd just clear out and, and go and sleep with the surgeon or something. I would. Look, look here, sir. Is that fastened what you may call securely or not, sir? Try it. Go on, try it, sir. If it will move a little bit. I tried the port and found it perfectly tight. Well, sir, continued Robert triumphantly, I wager my reputation as an A1 steward that in half an hour it will be open again. Fasten back too, sir. That's the awful thing. Fasten back. I examined the great screw and the loop nut that ran around it. If I find it open in the night, Robert, I will give you a sovereign. It is not possible. Go on, you may go. Sovereign, did you say, sir? Oh, very good, sir. Thank you, sir. Good night, sir. Pleasant repose and all manner of hitch and chant in dreams, sir. Robert scuttled away, delighted at being released. Of course, 
I thought he was going to account for his negligence by a silly story intended to frighten me, and I disbelieved him. The consequence was that he got his sovereign, and I spent a, a very peculiarly unpleasant night. I went to bed, and five minutes after I had rolled myself up in the blankets, the inexorable Robert extinguished the light that burned steadily behind the ground glass pane near the door. I lay quite still in the dark, trying to go to sleep, but I soon found that impossible. It had been some satisfaction to be angry with the steward, and the diversion had banished that unpleasant sensation I had at first experienced when I thought of the drowned men who had been my chum. But I was no longer sleepy, and I lay awake for some time, occasionally glancing at the porthole, which I could just see from where I lay, and which, in the darkness, looked like a faintly luminous soup-plate suspended in blackness. I believe I must have lain there for oh, an hour, and as I remember, I was just dozing into sleep when I was roused by the draught of cold air, and by distinctly feeling the spray of the sea blown upon my face. I started to my feet, and not having allowed in the dark for the motion of the ship, I was instantly thrown violently across the stateroom upon the couch which was placed beneath the porthole. Oh, I recovered myself immediately, however, and climbed upon my knees. The porthole was again wide open and fastened back. Now, now the, these things are facts. I was wide awake when I got up, and I should certainly have been waked by the fall had I been still dozing. Moreover, I bruised my elbow and knees badly, and the bruises were there on the following morning to testify to the fact. The porthole was wide open and fastened back. A thing so unaccountable that I remember very well feeling astonishment rather than fear when I discovered it. I at once closed the plate again and screwed down the loop up with all my strength. It was very dark in the stateroom. I reflected that the port had certainly been opened within the hour after Robert had at first shut it with in my presence, and I determined to watch it and see whether it would open again. Those brass fittings are very heavy and by no means easy to move. I could not believe that the clamp had been turned by the shaking of the screw. I stood peering through the thick glass at the alternate white and grey streaks of the sea that foamed beneath the ship's side. I must have remained there, oh, quarter of an hour. Suddenly, as I stood, I distinctly heard something moving behind me in one of the berths, and a moment afterwards, just as I turned instinctively to look, though I could, of course, see nothing in the darkness, I heard a very faint groan. I sprang across the stateroom and tore the curtains of the upper berth aside, thrusting my hands to discover if there were anyone in there. There was someone. I remember that sensation as I put my hands forward. It was as though I were plunging them into the air of a damp cellar, and from behind the curtains came a gust of wind that smelled horribly of stagnant seawater. I laid hold of something that had the shape of a man's arm, but was smooth and wet and icy cold. But suddenly, as I pulled, the creature sprang violently forward to me, a clammy, oozy mass, as it seemed heavy and wet, yet endowed with a sort of, a sort of supernatural strength. I reeled across the stateroom, and in an instant the door opened, and the thing rushed out. I had not the time to be frightened, and quickly recovering myself, I sprang through the door, and gave chase at the top of my speed. But I was too late. Ten yards before me, I could see, I am sure I saw it, a dark shadow moving in the dimly lighted passage, quickly as the shadow of a fast horse thrown before a dog cart by the lamp on a on a dark night. But in a moment it had disappeared, and I found myself holding on to the polished rail that ran alongside the bulkhead where the passage turned towards the companion. My hair stood on end, and the cold perspiration rolled down my face. Oh, I am not ashamed of it to the least. I was very, 
badly frightened. Still, I doubted my senses and pulled myself together. It was absurd, I thought. The, the, the Welsh rabbit I had eaten had disagreed with me. I had been in a nightmare. I, I made my way back to the stateroom and entered it with an effort. The whole place smelled of stagnant water, as it had when I walked on the, on the previous evening. It required my utmost strength to go in and grope among my things for a box of wax lights. As I lighted a railway le reading lantern, which I always carry in case I want to read after the lamps are out, I perceived that the whole the portal was again opened, and a sort of creeping horror began to take possession of me, which I had never felt before, nor wished to feel again. But I got a light and proceeded to examine the upper berth, expecting to find it drenched with sea water, but I was disappointed. The bed had been slept in, and the smell of the sea was strong, but the bedding was as dry as a bone. I fancied that Robert had not had the courage to make the bed after the accident of the previous night. It, 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 it had all been a, a hideous dream. I drew the curtains back as far as I could, and examined the place very carefully. It was perfectly dry, but the porthole was open again. With a sort of dull bewilderment of horror, I, I closed it and screwed it down, and, and thrusting my heavy stick through the brass loop, wrenched it with all my might, till the thick metal began to bend under the pressure. Then I hooked my reading lantern into the red velvet at the head of the couch, and sat down to recover my senses if I could. I sat there all night, unable to think of, of rest hardly able to think at all. But the portal remained closed, and I did not believe it would now open again without the application of a considerable force. The morning dawned at last, and I dressed myself slowly, thinking over all that had happened in the night. It was a beautiful day, and I went on deck, glad to get out into the early pure sunshine, and to smell the breeze from the blue water, so different from the noise and stagnant odour of my stateroom. Instinctively, I turned aft towards the surgeon's cabin. There he stood, with a pipe in his mouth, taking his morning airing precisely as on the previous day. Good morning, he said quietly, but looking at me with evident curiosity. Doctor, you were quite right, said I. There is something wrong about that place. I thought you would change your mind, he answered rather triumphantly. You have had a bad night, eh? Shall I make you a, a pick-me-up? I have a capital re recipe. Oh, n no, 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 thanks, I cried. But I would like to tell you what happened. I then tried to explain as clearly as possible precisely what had occurred not omitting to say that I had been scared as I had never been scared in my whole life before. I dwelt particularly on the phenomenon of the porthole, which was, in fact, to say, which I could testify, even if the rest had been an illusion. I had closed it twice in the night, and the second time I had actually bent the brass in wrenching it with my stick. I believe I insisted a good deal on this point. You seem to think I am likely to doubt the story, the doctor said, smiling at the detailed account of the state of the porto. I do not doubt it in the least. I, I renew my invitation to you. Bring your traps here and take my half of the cabin. Come and take half of mine for one night, I said. Oh, help me get to the bottom of this thing. You will get to the bottom of something else if you try answered the doctor. What? I asked. The bottom of the sea. I am going to leave this ship. It is not canny. Then you will not help me find out. Not I, said the doctor quickly. It is my business to keep my wits about me, not to go fiddling about with ghosts and things. Do you really believe it is a ghost? I inquired rather contemptuously. But as I spoke, I remembered very well of the horrible sensation of the supernatural which had 
got possession of me during the night. The doctor turned on me sharply. Have you any reasonable explanation for these things to offer? he asked. No, you have not. Well, you say you will find an explanation. I say you won't, sir, simply because there is not any. But, my dear sir, I retorted, do you, a, a man of science, tell me that such things cannot be explained? I do, he answered stoutly, and if they could, I would not be concerned with the explanation. I did not care to spend another night alone in the stateroom, and yet I was obstinately determined to get at the root of the disturbances. I do not believe there were many men who would have slept there alone after passing two such nights, but I made up my mind to try if I could not get anyone to share a watch with me. The doctor was evidently not inclined for such an experiment. He said he was a surgeon, and that, in case any accident occurred on board, he must always be in readiness. He could not afford to have his nerves unsettled. Perhaps, well, he was quite right, but I am inclined to think that his precaution was prompted by his inclination. On inquiry, he informed me that there was no one on board who would be likely to join me in my investigations, and after a little more conversation I left him. A little later, I met the captain and told him my story. I said that if no one would spend the night with me, I would ask my leave to have the light left burning all night, and would try it alone. Look here, said he, I will tell you what I will do. I will share your watch with myself, and we will see what happens. It is my belief that we can find out between us. Uh, that there, there may be some fellow skulking on board who steals a passage by frightening the passengers. It is just possible that there may be something queer in the carpentering of the berth. I suggested taking the ship's carpenter below and examining the place. But I was overjoyed that the captains offered to spend the night with me. He accordingly sent to the workman and ordered him to do anything I required. We went below at once. I had all the bedding cleared out of the upper berth, and we examined the place thoroughly to see if there was a board loose anywhere, or a panel which, which could be opened or pushed aside. We tried the planks everywhere, tapped the floors, unscrewed the fittings of the lower berth, and took it to pieces. In short, there was not a square inch of the stateroom which was not searched and tested. Everything was in perfect order, and we put everything back in its place. As we were finishing our work, Robert came to the door and looked in. Ah, well, sir. Find anything, sir? he asked with a ghastly grin. Oh, you were right about the portal, Robert, I said, and I gave him the promised sovereign. The carpenter did work skilfully and silently, following my directions. When he had done, he spoke. I'm a plain man, sir, he said but it's my belief you had better just turn out your things and let them run half a dozen four-inch screws through the door of this cabin. There's no good never come of the cabin yet, sir, and that's all about it. There's been four lives lost over here, to my remembrance, and that in four trips. Better give it up, sir. Better give it up. I will try it for one night more, I said. Better give it up, sir. Better give it up. Oh, it's a precious bad job, repeated the workman, putting his tools in the bag and leaving the captain cabin. But my spirits had risen considerably at the prospect of having the captain's company, and I made up my mind not to be prevented from going to the end of the strange business. I abstained from Welsh rabbits and grog that evening, and did not even join the customary game of whist. I wanted to be quite sure of my nerves, and my vanity made me anxious to make a good figure in the captain's eyes. The captain was one of those splendidly tough and cheerful specimens of seafaring humanity whose combined courage, hardiness, and calmness in difficult situations leads them naturally into high positions of trust. He was not the man to be led away by an idle tale 
and the mere fact that he was willing to join me in investigation was proof that he thought there was something seriously wrong which could not be accounted for on ordinary theories, nor laughed down as a common superstition. To some extent, too, his reputation was at stake, as well as the reputation of the ship. It is no light thing to lose passengers overboard, and he knew it. About ten o'clock that evening, as I was smoking the last cigar, he came up to me and drew me aside from the beat of the other passengers, who were patrolling the deck of the warm darkness. This is a serious matter, Mr. Brisbane, he said. We must make up our minds either way, to be disappointed or to have a pretty rough time of it. You see, I cannot afford to laugh at the affair, and I will ask you to sign your name to a statement of what ever occurs. It's nothing, if nothing happens tonight. We will try it again tomorrow and the next day. Now, are you ready? So we went below and entered the stateroom. As we went in, I could see Robert the steward, who stood a little further down the passage, watching us with his usual grin, as though certain that something dreadful was about to happen. The captain closed the door behind us and bolted it. Supposing we put our portmanteau before the door, he suggested. One of us can sit on it. Nothing can get out then. And is the port screwed down? I found it as I had left it in the morning. Indeed, without using a lever, as I had done, no one could have opened it. I drew back the curtains of the upper berth so that I could see well into it. By the captain's advice, I lighted my reading lantern and placed it so that it shone upon the white sheets above. He insisted upon sitting on the portmanteau, declaring that he wished to be able to swear that he had sat before the door. Then he requested me to search the stateroom thoroughly, an operation very soon accomplished, as it consisted merely in looking underneath the lower berth and under the couch below the porthole. The spaces were quite empty. It, it is impossible for any human being to get out, I said, or for any human being to open the port. Very good, the captain said calmly. If we see anything now, it must be either imagination or something supernatural. I sat down on the edge of the lower berth. The first time it happened, the captain said, crossing his legs and leaning back against the door, was in March. The passenger who slept here in the upper berth turned out to have been a lunatic. At all events, he was known to have been a little touched, and he had taken his passage without the knowledge of his friends. He rushed out in the middle of the night and threw himself overboard, before the officer who had what of the watch who could not stop him. We stopped and lowered the boat. It was a quiet night just before the heavy weather came on. But we we could not find him. Of course his suicide was afterward accounted for on the ground of his insanity. I suppose that, ha that often happens, I remarked, rather absently. Oh, not often, no, said the captain. Never before in my experience. Though I have heard of it happening aboard other ships. Well, as I was saying, that occurred in March, on the very next trip. What are you looking at? he asked, stopping suddenly in his narration. I believe I gave no answer. My eyes were riveted upon the porthole. It seemed to me that the brass loop knob was beginning to turn very slowly upon the screw. So well, so slowly, however, that I was not sure it moved at all. I watched it intently fixing its position in my mind and trying to ascertain whether it changed, seeing where I was looking. The captain looked too. It moves, he exclaimed in a tone of conviction. No, it does not, he added after a minute. If it were the jarring of the screw, said I, it would have opened during the day, but I found it this evening jammed tight as I left it in the morning. I rose and tried the nut. It was certainly loosened by an effort. I could move it with my hands. Oh, the queer thing, said the captain, is that the second man who was lost 
is supposed to have got through that very port. We had a terrible time over it. It was in the middle of the night, and the weather was very heavy. There was an alarm that one of the ports was open and the sea running in. I came below and found everything flooded, the water pouring in every time she rolled, and the whole port swinging from the top bolts, not the porthole in the middle. Well, we managed to shut it, but the, the water did some damage. Ever since that place smells of seawater from time to time, we, we suppose the passenger had thrown himself out, though the Lord only knows how he did it. The steward kept telling me that he cannot keep anything shut here. Upon my word, I can smell it now. Cannot you? He inquired, sniffing the air suspiciously. Yes, distinctly, I said, and I shuddered, as that same odour of stagnant seawater grew stronger in the cabin. Now, to smell like this, the place must be damp. I continued, and yet when I examined it with a carpenter this morning, everything was perfectly dry. It was most extraordinary. Hello? My reading light, which had been placed on the upper berth, was suddenly extinguished. There was still a good deal of light from the pane of ground glass near the door, behind which loomed the regulation lamp. The ship rolled heavily, and the curtain of the upper berth swung far out to the stateroom and back again. I rose quickly from my seat to the edge of the bed, and the captain at the same moment started to his feet with a loud cry of surprise. I had turned with the intention of taking down the lantern to examine it when I heard this exclamation, and immediately afterwards his call for help. I sprang towards him. He was wrestling with all his might with the brass loop at the port. It seemed to turn against his hands in spite of all his efforts. I caught up my cane, a heavy stick, and thrust it through the ring, and bore it with all my strength. But the strong wood snapped suddenly, and I fell the upon the couch. When I rose again, the port was wide open, and the captain was standing with his back against the door, pale to his lips. There is something in that berth, he cried in a strange voice his eyes almost starting from his head. Hold the door while I look. It shall not escape us, whatever it is. But instead of taking his place, I sprang upon the lower bed and see something which lay in the upper berth. It was something ghostly, horrible beyond words, and it moved in my grip. It, it, it was like the body of a man, long drowned, and yet it moved and had the strength of ten men living. But I, I gripped it with all my might, the slippery, oozy, horrible thing. The dead white eyes seemed to stare at me out of the dusk. The putrid odour of rank sea water was about it, and its shiny hair hung in foul, wet curls over its dead face. I wrestled with the dead thing. It thrust itself upon me and forced me back, and nearly broke my arms. It wound its corpse's arms about my neck. The living death! And, and power overpowered me, so that I, at last, cried aloud, and fell, and left my hold. As I fell, the thing sprang across me, and seemed to throw itself upon the captain. When I last saw him on his feet, his face was white and his lips set. It seemed to me that he struck a violent blow at the dead being, and then he, too, fell forward upon his face with an inarticulate cry of horror. The thing paused an instant, seeming to hover over his prostrate body, and I could have screamed again for the very fright, but I had no voice left. The thing vanished suddenly, and it seemed to my disturbed senses that it made its exit through the open port though how that was possible, considering the smallness of the aperture, if this more than anyone can tell. I lay a long time upon the floor, and the captain lay beside me. At last, I partially recovered my senses and moved, and instantly I knew that my left arm was broken. 
the small bone of my arm near the wrist. I got upon my feet somehow, and with my remaining hand I tried to raise the captain. Oh, he groaned and moved, and at last came to himself. He was not hurt, but he seemed badly stunned. Well, do you want to hear any more? There is nothing more. That is the end of my story. The carpenter carried out his scheme of running half a dozen four-inch screws through the door of 105, and if you ever take passage in that ship, you may ask for a berth in the stateroom. You'll be told that it is engaged. Yes, it is engaged by that dead thing. I finished the trip in the surgeon's cabin. He doctored my broken arm and advised me not to fiddle about with the ghosts and things any more. The captain was very silent, and never again sailed in that ship, though it is still running, and I will not sail in her either. It was a very disagreeable experience, and I was very badly frightened, which is a thing I do not like. That is all. That is how I saw a ghost, if it was a ghost. It was dead, anyhow. Nobody spoke for some time after the novelist finished his story. The wind, which had changed and freshened during his recital, whistled through the rigging overhead, and the vessel rolled heavily from side to side as she bowled along, every other minute bringing the black hurrying waters directly under the feet of the group by the deckhouse. At last, the silence was broken by Beatrice, who exclaimed under her breath, Oh, I shall sleep in the saloon tonight. I never heard anything so creepy in my life. There is something decidedly original in the idea of smelling a ghost, said the critic. But for a ghost to be big and solid enough to break Brisbane's arm, and yet small enough to get through a porthole, well, savours of the improbable. Now, if his atmosphere had been poisonous, and Brisbane had been found suffocated, or if he had only had a, a little more of the Ram Lal style of going to work about him, Pshaw! exclaimed the romancer. That story is true, every word of it. Nobody can make me believe I should sit here and shiver at a concoction. Every story that makes your flesh creep is a true story. Without that postulate, there could be no romance. Therefore, ghosts exist, as everybody knows. Oh, how do you know? inquired the tragedian blandly, seeing his opportunity. Have you ever seen one? That is a question, remarked the romancer, which no man has a right to put to another. It's as bad, and in the same way, as asking a man whether certain things move him to sins of the imagination. If I have seen ghosts, it is because I have deserved to see ghosts. And if I have deserved to see ghosts, why, even the law, the unfairest thing on earth, would not ask me to criminate myself by saying so. But I have no objection to telling you about a story of a ghost that somebody saw. Well, if you care to hear. Oh, the company cared very much indeed, as the romancer learned instantly. So with the practice ease of a man who is master of his subject, his style, and himself, he plunged at once into the middle of his story. End of section two.